Hi, I'm Tyson Franklin, and welcome to this week's episode of the Podiatry Legends Podcast. The podcast is designed to help you feel, see, and think differently about the podiatry profession. This week's episode and next week's episode, so this week's going to be part one, next week will be part two, and it's called Group Perspective on Good, Bad, and Difficult Patients. Now, this came about because back on episode 307, I did an episode titled The Difference Between bad and difficult patients and there was a little bit of feedback from that and I thought it was fantastic because I like it that we don't all think the same way so I thought let's get a group of podiatrists on here do short interviews with them individually and get their perspective on what is the difference between good bad and difficult and the answers I got were absolutely fantastic now I had three podiatrists from the UK one from the United States and four from Australia so there's going to be four on this particular episode and next week, I will have another four. And in between each interview, you're going to hear a little noise, which means we've now moved on to the next interview. So like I said, there's four this week, before next week. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. With me now is Robert Isaacs from Headcorn Podiatry Clinic in the UK. And if you're watching the video, you see this huge smile on faces. Of course, we were just talking about the name Headcorn. I thought... Robert had made that name up, but then I realised when I went to Google Maps, it's actually a real town or a village. It's a village. Village. It's a village. So they, I, they get I, very funny about it. If you call it a town, they do not like it at all. It's. I'm not <laughs> sure what the difference is. I thought it was funny. So I looked it up. It's only got about three and a half thousand people there. Yeah, it's not. So I do my um, research. <laughs> always nice. Yes, we. It's a, a two chair clinic for podiatrists. And we run five days a week. So we do pretty well for a, a small village. Which I think is fantastic. I always say that to people that it doesn't matter how small a place is, because sometimes people will be in a town that's 25,000 and they're going, oh, it's not busy enough. I'm going, but I know people who are in towns of like 7,000 who are just inundated with work. Yeah, that's good. And th this works well too, because you being in a smaller town and on this particular subject about good, bad and so difficult patients, you will probably have a slightly different perspective on it because being in a really small town, which means, you, do you live in that town as well? No, I don't. No, I don't. But it's, a, it's a small place where everybody knows you. So Yeah, I was going to say, so you, you're the local podiatry clinic. There. Are there, is there any other podiatrists in that town? No other clinics. There's <laughs> next one's in the next village over. Um, okay, so how far away do you actually live from the village? About half an hour, about 30 minutes. So they could track you down if they needed to. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, the, my, my problem there is that I've worked in Kent and around Kent for about 20 years. So I've seen pretty much every knackered foot, either in the NHS or in that clinic or in some other capacity. So, yeah, the, the reputation does follow you and it is incredibly important. Yeah. Okay, let's get on to the subject because otherwise yes. we'll go off on a completely different tangent. We'll end up doing a whole podcast episode on Robert Isaacs, which – isn't out of the question we'll in the future. Yeah, no. I drag good stuff out of people. So let's let's stick to the topic then. So good, bad, and difficult patients. What what's your perspective on that? What's your thinking? Okay. So I think my my perspective on that is that the very act of categorizing people like that is a bad idea. Okay. Um, which I know slightly sort of flies in the face, but it, it's a different perspective. So I think it, it it's worth enlarging on. You, you made the point in the, the last podcast that it's not a question of good or difficult. That difficult, the antonym of difficult is easy, not good. You can have difficult patients who are brilliant patients. That good and bad is opposite to one another. So if the opposite of a good patient is a bad patient. I do not like that as a concept for a few reasons. One of them is that all of the examples that you gave are all unhappy patients. That's something you can objectively say about them. And we've all been unhappy patients. Oh, yeah. We, or not patients, then consumers, customers. Yeah. If you are at a garage and you think that they are overcharging you or that they have done shoddy work, you will complain. You will, argue, you know, potentially refuse to pay what they want you to do. And by defining a patient as bad, what we are doing is functionally abdicating any responsibility for their negative experience to me what that says is 
well, it's a bad patient. They're not happy because they couldn't have been happy. We couldn't have helped them. It was impossible. They're bad. If they were difficult, then we could have fixed it. We could have, by doing the extra bits, going the extra mile, as you discussed, we could have managed it. If we're saying they are bad, then it's an escape hatch from the reflective practice that we're trying to encourage people to have. Because instead of then the thought process being, okay, this patient wasn't happy for whatever mm. reason, didn't think they had a good service, they didn't think they had value for money, um, They that what we were advertising was not what they received. Instead of that reflection, we have a very simple, easy out. We can just say they were a bad patient. And because of that, I don't need to reflect. Yeah. Now, if you are a, a great podiatrist, if you're a tremendous podiatrist, then you might be able to do that. And you might be able to say, yeah, d- genuinely, those people couldn't have been helped. I, I I, could have been God himself. They wouldn't have been happy. But we're all on a journey. We're all becoming that better podiatrist every year. And for those people who need that reflection, giving them this concept of it being a bad patient that couldn't have been helped, it, it, it is poison to the idea of reflective practice. I know I I totally understand that because say you've been unhappy once or you've gone to a restaurant you didn't like the meal and you you complain about it which I think is fair enough but if you went back to the same restaurant and constantly complained every single time you went there then they wouldn't class you as a good customer they'd have to be they they should be asking why is this person coming back they should be going into a, a <laughs> that's a good question of reflexive practice from a yeah. restaurant point of view because uh, we nobody likes bad service nobody deliberately puts themselves in the path of bad service mm. just to enlarge on, it, it feeds in as well to something and you enlarged on the bad patient concept yeah in talking about team members and mentors and professional colleagues and the the people that we are around and that we should seek the company of people who uplift us and that if it's not uplifting we should not do it which is kind of two sides of the same coin it, it's the concept that there are bad mentors that there are bad coaches that there are bad faith actors in the online community for example And I have the same problem there Yeah. in that not all positive and helpful experiences are nice. In fact, some of the most positive and helpful experiences can be downright gutsy. And some of the best mentors I've had have been people who have been critical, and that is why they have been the best mentors. Oh, no, but being Um, being critical can be a positive if, yeah, there's, if there's a glaring problem and somebody can't see it, sometimes it takes a, a good friend or a good, yeah, or it takes a good friend or a good mentor or just somebody who's willing to say, sorry, but I can't sugarcoat this. This is the this is what is actually happening and you need to be aware of it. You need that. And that that is not always. And it's the same concept of the bad patient cop out. I'm going to call it that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the bad patient cop out allows us to to insulate ourselves from the discomfort of the idea that we haven't done as well as we might have. The bad experience with a colleague, the bad, the critical mentor, the uncomfortable interaction, and you and I have had a few, yeah. um, have been really useful for me. And I think that they are. It's really important to do that. There are there have been episodes of the pod legends podcast that made me want to open a vein they were as far <laughs> away from get from uplifting as it is possible to get yeah and if i was following this advice of positivity and seeking people who uplift you and seeking sources of information that make you feel good i would have avoided it completely yeah i have also learned a tremendous amount from it and even those episodes and even those commentaries and even those things which I found desperately uncomfortable have been useful and I think that is something within our practices that we need to get more comfortable with being uncomfortable 
And if we simply dismiss patients as bad patients, then we don't have to. Um, The last point I would make on that is that one of one of the best episodes that I've seen on Pod Legends is Jonathan's one on the friends and family. All right, yeah. Um, the, the friends and family test. Would you send your? Ah, uh, yeah. I, I, my version of that is the mum test. You know, what would you do if it was your mum? Yeah, and we uh, used to say that a lot. Yeah, and the the answer to that is every. I've worked with a lot of podiatrists over the last twenty years. I've employed a lot of people. I've worked for a lot of people. I've worked with a lot of people. All the great ones have one thing in common, which is caring. Yeah. They all care very deeply about their patients, and that can be very uncomfortable because if you care about your patients and when something goes wrong or they're not happy, it's horrible. It it stinks. Um, If we're thinking in terms of bad patients being weeds that have to be pulled out from the garden of our clinic or that they are lousy patients that you have to state the blindingly obvious to. You, it, it's a little bit neurolinguistic programming. The, the words that we use shape the ideas in our head. And I worry that is a toxic influence on that caring. We are focusing our care only on the patients that make us feel good, our A's and our B's, to use the, that categorization and dismissing the others, I worry that would that will corrode people's compassion, for want of a better word. No, that, I think that's all really good feedback because, like, even before we pressed record, we, we were talking briefly on marketing, mm-hmm. and then you explained to me, what, you finally explained to me what you meant by toxic. Well, we won't go into it, but it was a great explanation. Yeah, using ura- uranium, that might come up in a future episode. So, And that's why I wanted to get, that's why I was really hoping you would come on. Because well, when I released, I'm a little surprised you said yes. To be honest, <laughs> no. But when I released that episode 307 and your initial comments, and then there was a little bit of banter, and then we direct messaged each other outside of the Facebook page. That's what prompted this episode because I thought it'd be really good to get other people's perspectives. Even though, does it mean that I hear you now and I go, "Oh, my thinking has completely changed." Wouldn't I wouldn't say that. completely, but you have changed it a little bit. And that's why even when I have guests on the podcast, I don't agree with every single thing that everybody says. <laughs> you couldn't. Some of them have been mutually exclusive. Oh, some of them have been. <laughs> yeah, some of them, just some of the comments I don't always agree with. But I mentioned it to you when we were direct messaging each other that the podcast has never been here to try and have a debate. It's really about people sharing their stories. There's other things. There's other places people can debate. Here's to- I, I think there's a platform for that, though. I'm a great believer that you do want more light than heat, but well, maybe they need problem. to be the Robert Isaacs podcast. Oh God, no! I don't need. Oh, another you project. should do it. You should do it. I, I'm already doing a monthly case study chat thing. I do. Oh I, no, I'm, I'm. I don't have that in me. <laughs> It'd be funny though. That would be funny. Be, oh, yeah. There's a place for Fight Club, I think. <laughs> Podiatry Fight Club, you reckon that's what it should be called, Podiatry Fight Club. Look, if, so if somebody's <laughs> listening to this and you want to set up a podcast called Podiatry Fight Club, by all means, I think it would go really well. And number one, first guest should be Robert. <laughs> Alex and I, <laughs> Alex Murray and I did do one of those and we both thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah. Okay, Robert, I want to thank, thank you. you for coming on here, sharing your perspective on this. It's been fantastic. So I look forward to chatting to you again soon. Peace out. So I thought now would be a perfect time to just dive in and remind everybody that if you're looking or considering a podiatry business coach, before you reach out to some of the larger coaching companies, please go to my website, tysonfranklin.com, and read through the coaching section. You'll see I've got a model there called the Thriving Podiatry Business Model. And after you read through everything, there's also a link to my online calendar. From there, we can organize a 30-minute Zoom call. We'll have a bit of a talk. I'll explain the thriving podiatry business model in a bit more detail. And you may find just after that call, that is all you need just to give yourself a little bit of guidance. But if you want to take it further, I can give you more information. So please go to my website, tysonfranklin.com, and I look forward to talking to you soon. Okay, let's get back to the interview. Okay, with me now is Cameron Bennett from My Family Podiatry in Brisbane. 
And Cameron was on this podcast, episode 297, The Benefit of Early Career Wins, which that episode has been going really well, just so you know. How good is that? <laughs> well, I think That's it's an important. early podcast win. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got you on here. We're talking about good, bad, and difficult patients. And I'm getting a few podiatrist thoughts on this particular matter because as I mentioned, I've spoken about it on a solo episode that I did. So what, what you're thinking when you hear people talk about bad or difficult patients, what goes through your mind? How, how would you classify them? I get this question a little bit from patients where they're like, you know, what do you like to treat or who are your favorite people? Or, you know, or I guess the inverse to that, who don't you like to treat? And okay. it's really interesting because I wouldn't say that there's like a, a patient group or a certain treatment type that's you know, maybe the one thing that I enjoy. Typically, it's more the person that's going to come in. So, you know, I had a listen to your solo episode talking about the bad and difficult ones. And I want to add a couple of things to some of those ones. So I I love a challenging patient, you know, that yeah. one that comes through the door, uh, a few more complex things. Maybe they've seen a couple of people beforehand and haven't got the results that they're looking for. And they've come to you for that other opinion. So whenever people come in, I'll say, you know, yeah, and normally they'll self-identify as, oh, I'm going to be a challenge or I'm going to be a bit more <laughs> complex or whatever. And sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. But I always say like, yeah, I love the challenge. It's something more interesting. It, it provides us that little bit of, uh, you got to use your brain. You got to, you know, sometimes with podiatry, we can see the same conditions over and over again. And each person is different and we're going to treat them slightly differently. But it's these ones where you have to think that little bit outside the box, something a little bit more abstract, that can be really good. And getting those more difficult patients, normally they'll work with you. They'll, they want to achieve a resolution of their problem. So mm. if you're heading in a direction, you're trying some things out, maybe you're, you're genuinely wanting to achieve an outcome for them, they're going to they're gonna come along for the ride with you. Now, bad patients. There's this one thing that I always find with a bad patient. And with a bad one, these are the ones that, I genuinely don't enjoy treating the ones that you see their name in the book and you kind of go, here we go again. Yeah. And the one thing that they always seem to have in common is that they'll be really nice to you in the treatment room and then an absolute jerk to front desk. You know, maybe okay. it's when they call up, maybe it's when they walk in the door, whatever it is, it's this arrogant, rude persona. They treat everyone else that's kind of, you know, the underlings as worse. And then they come into the room and, oh, Cameron, how are you? You know what? I can't stand it. I can't stand it. Like the way that you treat, you know, the it, it's just, it's a lack of respect, right? And yeah. I always find that's this one commonality among so many of these bad patients. And it's really easy to identify them because they'll be the ones then that don't want to pay for a treatment, that complain about stuff that it just make your life miserable. You know, they're running late and they just treat the reception rude or they, yeah, I don't know, they just... Maybe we should class them as unenjoyable patients. There's certainly that. It's the ones you don't want to see. You know, that yeah. name pops up in the book and you just go, do I have to do this? And I guess, no, you don't. You don't have to do this. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and that can be <laughs> some of those ones that potentially you refer on elsewhere or whatever. Whereas I've always found that with those difficult ones, working with them and working through the processes, you can typically achieve a really good outcome. And then normally they're going to be your biggest fans. They're going to be the ones that rave about you, leave you good reviews, you know, tell all their friends because you're the one that's actually put in the time and the effort and interest into their case. And then, you know, those difficult ones, even if you don't achieve perfection, you don't achieve a complete resolution, the fact that you've put in the effort and you've got them to a point and then maybe you've referred them to the next person that can help them, they're, they're so grateful and they love it. On the good and bad, though, there's certainly some people come in here and on the surface, they're going to be a great patient. Maybe it's a biomechanical, some kind of sports injury, but they come into the room and it's just the person. Yeah. You know, the person, you just don't click. There's something going on there. And then the flip to that, some of my generals that come in here, just the nice people, you know, you come in and, and they're kind of the more simple maybe more boring cases but you just get them in you have a chat it actually brightens your day to see these people mm. so yeah i guess when i saw this topic come up good and bad and i know that certainly in some of the early years people will go oh fantastic i just want to go 
the biomech clinic where I'm going to see all these good patients. And it's like, man, Ooh, I've got some no. good, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've, I've got some good patients who are, are general. I've got some good patients who are biomech. I've got some good patients who are whatever. It's not the presenting complaint. Typically that's the good. It's the, it's the person. And then, yeah, the same with the bad. There's very, yeah. What should on the surface be a, a good patient, but potentially they come into the room, they have no buy-in. They don't want to participate. They don't want to do their exercises. They don't want to change their footwear. They don't want to comply with any of your treatment plan that is not a difficult patient that is a bad patient <laughs> that's that's the that sort of differentiation there yeah because prior to doing the recording theo was talking to robert isaacs and he mentioned the word unhappy patient and i thought that was yeah. a it was a good selection of words actually because i think there's also a distinction between bad and unhappy because you can have yep. an unhappy patient who's just not happy with the service they've received mightn't have been yep. happy with how they were greeted at the front but I think a bad patient is a little bit different again. I, I suppose there's a whole spectrum of <laughs> why some of these people will be good, good, bad, or difficult. But now right. we've got good, bad, unhappy, enjoyable, unenjoyable, yeah. and and then you've got difficult, and then there's all these uh, different variations. So I'm hoping people that listen to this sort of understand, even though we may have said good, bad, and difficult, there's an array of different types of patients that you would actually see. And I, I used to say to a receptionist, just because somebody is unhappy the first time they come in or you might think they're a bad patient that day, yep. it's, you've got to see them a few times to really work that out because you don't know what's happened to them leading up to that visit. You know, if something's gone on in their life, a problem with their partner, argument with their children, a problem at work, sometimes they can lash out at you and it, yep. it's not you. But if it yep. happens repeatedly, then there might be a problem. Yeah, definitely. And sometimes it's they have been through this process before. They've seen three other people and haven't got an outcome. And then you've – so they're coming in with these preconceptions and then maybe whatever you do in that first appointment does achieve them a result. By the time they come back, they're, they're stoked, you know, and, and this whole personality's changed. They're a completely different person because – you've put in the effort, you've actually achieved something with them compared to, you know, maybe they've just been fobbed off at previous places. So it can sometimes be hard to base it on that, yeah, that face value or that initial appointment. But yeah, yeah definitely, as, as you say, if this is a repeated thing, it might be time for a referral um, <laughs> to, to someone else. Yeah, I like what you said at the beginning. It's when you see the name in the book that you straight away, because I used to have, I remember this old lady used to come and see just to cut her toenails. And I, every time I saw her name in the book, I could not wait to see her because yeah. we just had the best conversation and yep. she knew I played the guitar. So she would recommend songs for me. And that's how I learned to do Margaritaville. She said, oh, this is a song you've got to, got to learn to play. So it's not the type of work. It's the personality of the patient. And, yeah. and like we said, you can't judge it on that first visit. It's what they, it's their actions over a period of time. And it's the personality of the patient matching with your pers personality as well. And I think that's a really important point because I know that for myself and some of my team members, we're very different. And so someone who maybe really likes me might not like them and vice versa. You know, yeah. Sometimes they'll come in and they'll, get, they'll be happy enough. Like the treatment standard is fine, but the experience that they get from it is maybe just not what they expected purely because of the way that personalities interact. And sometimes if you feel that person can get benefit from your services. Perhaps it's that it's a different member of your team that's going to be the best fit for them rather than, you know, that they're actually a bad patient. It could just be that, yeah, you guys just, you don't get along with everyone in the real world. So why would you get along with every single person, you know, coming yeah. into your clinic? That's a good point. And it is too. I always say to coaching clients, when you're employing a podiatrist for your team, employ someone your patients are going to like. Yeah. I like having fun. So my whole clinic was all based around fun. I employed people that yeah. wanted to have fun we made the whole environment fun. But there were certain patients didn't like that. Yeah, absolutely. They weren't expecting it's, that. No, it's this it's the same here where, you know, people come in and for whatever reason, there's just something about what they had their preconceived notion of what they would be achieving or you know, receiving in their podiatry appointment versus what they received. Don't marry up. And yeah, yeah as you say, maybe it's personality, maybe it's environment, maybe it's whatever it may be but i guess if you can identify that as well and you know, is there anything we could have done better is there anything different you know and some of these like you know feedback sort of pathways to try and get some you know you obviously want to be able to achieve a better outcome for more people if possible yeah i always talk about there's a patient journey i talked about this in the reboot that 
there's a whole pile of things. There's like 50 different things that can happen before a patient ever meets the podiatrist for the first time. And any one of those 50 things could put them off. Before you, and all yeah. of a sudden you go, I, can't, I don't know why they don't like me, but I can just tell they don't like me. So it's like part yeah. A, and then part B is that initial visit that you actually run through. And then I'm working on this part C part at the moment. That is the journey once they've met you and what happens after that. So yeah. any breakdown there could basically have an effect. So do you have any final points or anything you want to say before we wrap up? Yeah, just lumping people into an arbitrary category can be tough, uh, especially mm. based on appointment type. If you go, okay, they're a biomech, they'll be good. If they're a general, they'll be bad. I don't know. Not at all. Especially in the early stage of your career, identify what you like in a person, what kind of pa patients you enjoy seeing, because that's going to be one of the most important parts. And don't forget that someone who comes in as a general may end up going to a biomech, may end up going to a surgery, may end up going to whatever else. And you know, finding ways of being able to interact with people day to day is and finding enjoyment in actually helping and treating people i think is the way of ensuring that you're going to have more good patients than bad and, and then enjoying the challenge of those difficult ones that is fantastic so cameron thank you very much for uh sharing your thoughts tyson thanks for having me okay with me now is estelle humphreys and she is from the gate movement you may re recognize that name because that is an online course that you can do but estelle was also on the podcast episode 244 and it was titled Surprise, surprise, the gate movement. So Estelle, how are you doing today? Good, thank you, Tyson. Good to be so, here. Thank you for coming on here and sharing a little bit of your wisdom or your experience on good, bad, and what we class as difficult patients. So what are, what are your thoughts? Well, perhaps start with the bad patient. I listened to one of your previous podcasts on the bad patients and that made me think, what does that mean to me? Yeah. Um, and I would say the bad patients are the ones with the I can't attitude, basically to all your ideas. Like they've come to you and they're paying for you to help them, but every bit of advice that you give them, there's a reason why they can't do that. Oh, here are some exercises that could help for these reasons. And they say, oh, no, I can't do that because it'll hurt this or I'll pull up sore the next day. And even if you explain to them, Yes, if you pull up sore, that's just a little bit of delayed onset muscle soreness and give them reasons. They just keep chucking everything back in your face. Yeah. And they're the ones that you'll tend to go over time with in clinic and then stress stress you out because the rest of your day runs behind because you don't feel satisfied unless you find something in that appointment to give them to go home with because um, otherwise you feel like you failed with your job. But at, at the end of the day, I think you've got to draw the line some where and say, look, you come to me with this problem. These are my recommendations and then leave it to them if they choose to take them or not because otherwise so, these are the clients that will drain you. <laughs> yeah, they do. Can I ask you a question though? <laughs> Would you class them really as being a bad patient or just really a non-compliant patient? Because they still might be a nice person but just don't want to do what you're telling them to do. I feel like these are the ones though that, are even sort of negative in their tone of voice. So okay. I would yeah, this different. these ones as a bad patient. You, they don't even seem nice or there's no banter back and forth or any other conversation. It's all about them. What can you do to fix them? But they don't want to do anything that you suggest to fix them. Um, okay. So you don't put them in the difficult category where it's it's just difficult getting them to comply. You're, they just draw on the line and go, no, nah, not going to do it. <laughs> And they give you a bit of attitude at the same time. Attitude, yes. Yeah. I had to think about what differs between the difficult and the bad patient. And look, those bad patients are difficult too, I guess. Yeah. Um, but I had sort of two definitions, if you like, of the difficult client. Yeah, no, that's right. The good part with all this, there is no right or wrong. What what, what yeah. you think good, bad and difficult is and, and what I think it is and what the other guests think it is, doesn't really matter. That's, that's our opinion. We're allowed to have it. Yeah. And we'll all see these types of clients in different ways. <laughs> and that's so, what I said to you off air. Sometimes, like, if you want to go through A, B, C, D, for example, someone's D client or patient could be another business's A or B type patient or client, depending yeah. on how their business is actually set up. And so if you were a bulk billing clinic and you were just bulk billing, you probably don't care. If they're yeah. bad, as long as they, they come, they go, bulk build, done. Yeah. Well, some people might thrive off the challenge of, I don't know, turning it around. I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, no, I'm sure there's some podiatrists that 
someone that I might look at and go, oh, I think they're a bad patient, for example, that they may see them, but they they just get on. They, there's something about them that just clicks with that patient. So sometimes maybe it's not just always the patient. It could be us. Yeah, and personalities. Personalities don't sort of match, but then they go and see somebody else and all of a sudden they listen to everything they say and you go, you are kidding me. Yeah. <laughs> what did I, where did I, can you teach me what you did there? Well, any podiatrists out there who like the sound of my bad patient, <laughs> reach out to me, stick your hand up. <laughs> uh, so what would you class as a good patient then? I feel the good patients are the ones, well, they're the reasons we get up in the morning. They're the reasons we do our job. They're polite. That's always a good start. They they know why they're there to see you. They give you a good history. They also, though, know the relevant parts of their history. They don't dawdle on the details like, did my foot start hurting at 3 p.m. or was it 4.30? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it takes ages to get to the story and things. But then also there's a bit of banter back and forth, maybe not in the first consult, but as you get to know them, like they'll even ask you questions about you. It's okay to ask your clinician things about them. I mean, I go by the rule, the consult should be sort of 70 to 80% then, but it's okay if there's a little bit of you in there because that's about building relationships and these are the clients that you either manage to help and they respond well to treatment and you might send them on their way or they're regulars that keep coming back. Yeah. And they give you a smile when you see their name in the book. Yeah, that's true. I always find too, ones that I used to class as my good patients, the one I enjoyed seeing, when they walked in the room, they would always ask, how's your day going? They yeah. actually want to know how you're doing as well, which just opens up like a friendlier conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. So you got you got your bad, you got your good. What do you class as a difficult uh, patient then? I had two in my head. Uh, one was sort of the hypochondriac. They come to you for advice and they mean well and they might be lovely and things, but every time you come and see them, if it's for even if it's for routine treatment, they have something new, a new problem. But you can't dismiss any pain that people mention. You have to address it. Yeah. You have to go into it. But sometimes you're just thinking. Look, if it happened one time or if it hurts when you put your foot on this angle, just don't put your foot on that angle. <laughs> <laughs> it, just, it reminds me of a patient once. He said, oh, when I bend down and do this and I turn this way and then I lift my arm up here, I get this pain in my knee here. And I go, that's fair enough. In what time of day do you really need to be in that position? I go, well, never, but it's just when I do that hurts. And I go, well, don't do it. Exactly. <laughs> and I think we've all had patients like that. And then you're like, oh, I have to document that conversation. I have to write that down. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> one of the difficult clients. The other one, which we've all come across before, is the client who comes in with textbook symptoms and you throw all your normal treatments at them and they just don't respond to anything and you're banging your head against the brick wall. At that point, I've learned to perhaps call on other disciplines for referrals and opinions. Every now and then you come across a client that something like heel pain, where we pride ourselves being that being an area of our expertise, and you cannot get that heel pain to go away. You might improve it a bit, but you can't always fix everyone. Yeah, and I think that's where the, the whole communication side is really important too, because you can have someone where it's a difficult problem and you throw everything at it and it's not responding. But as long as the lines of communication with the patient are still good, then they're usually happy too if you refer them somewhere else. Absolutely. I found that too, yeah. Because they know you've tried your best. But the communication side sometimes just... So, like I remember I had this boy and he was 15 and I just said to him, can you touch your toes? So he's standing there. I said, can you touch your toes? So he proceeded to rub his two big toes together. <laughs> and I just looked at him and his fa I looked at his father and the father just started shaking his head and going, you are an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> but I learned a lot from that because the kid then turned around the father and said, well, if he explained himself a little bit more clearly, maybe I would have understood what he said. And I'm thinking, well, fair enough. He did exactly what I told him to do. Can you touch your toes? Yes. And he touched them, but not with his hands, which is what I'm thinking. But that, also that made me realise too when I'm talking with patients, actually be really clear, don't assume that what you've said to them, they actually understand. Do you ever get them to repeat back instructions to you? I should do it more. Like I always think I should and I do it sometimes. But, yeah, 
that's it. That's the best way to work out that people have understood you. I often say, okay, just to summarize, you're going to do this, this and I dot point everything. Yeah. Then they still nod along, but I should get them to repeat it back to me because that's a great communication technique. Which can probably help you sometimes if there's that difficult client is making sure that they understand the instruction you've given them and that they, like, I mean, they fully understand. They're not just nodding their head. And I know I've been placed and they're telling me something and I may not even be paying attention. I'm just nodding. This could be with my wife when she's talking sometimes, giving me instructions to do something. And then later she'll go, I thought I told you to go, I wasn't really listening. <laughs> That's never the right answer. That's always a, any male listening to this, that is always the wrong answer. Never tell your wife you weren't listening. Just say that you need further instructions. <laughs> yeah. So, so with the good, bad and difficult, have you got any other final comments that you'd like to, to finish on or any advice that, yeah, maybe for a you know, new graduate listening to this? Yeah, well, I guess with that last point, remember, you can't fix everyone. Try everything you can, but then you need to find a way or a script yourself to deliver the news to them. Look, we've tried all these things. You haven't responded I think you should perhaps go and look down this path, refer them on to someone else. That's okay to do. The referral is okay. Yeah. And also with the bad patients, don't let them bring you down. Don't let them drain you. Keep an eye on your clock. If you're approaching the end of the appointment, find a way to wrap it up and say, look, this is what I recommend. I'll take you to the counter. The admin will talk you through the booking process and you can decide whether to go ahead or not. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Mm. And that's what you said before. It's those patients sometimes, if you let them keep going on, it will put you behind for the rest of your patients, which may then start annoying them. But you said Joel Keehan had a tip that you'd like to share. For the good ones. Yeah. Yeah. Joel and I both do this apparently. I saw one of his content videos the other day. I'm like, ah, I do that too. Your favourite clients, uh, especially while you're building your books, schedule them at the end of your day or on the last day of the week so you finish your week on a good note. I always yeah. used to do that. Of course, once you weasel out all the bad patients out of your books, then it's less of a problem, but definitely in the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Well, Joe is, even if he doesn't end up on this particular podcast episode, he's still mentioned, which he'll yeah. like. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I want to thank you for that. And well, thanks for coming on and uh, sharing your wisdom in this area. No problem. Thanks, Tyson. Okay, with me now is D.L. Walker. She is a corrective functional therapist, specializes in foot and ankle problems. If you recognize that name, that's because D.L. and I did some webinars in 2023 together, which were extremely popular. And she was also on the podcast in episode 228, where we spoke about comprehensive treatment of Halix Limitus. So, D.L., how are you doing today? I'm great, Tyson. How are you? I am fantastic. And I'm so glad that you came on here because everybody else so far has been a podiatrist. And mm. you are not a podiatrist. However, you deal with patients. So it'd be really interesting to get a different perspective on good, bad, unhappy, difficult, mm. challenging patients, how you actually see it. And as I've yeah. said to some other people, there are no right or wrong answers. It's your perspective on it. So exactly. I'm going to hand it over to you. What are your thoughts? My thoughts on that is that I look at it as a bit on a bit of a spiritual manner. So sometimes, right? What we're experiencing in the outside world is really a reflection of sometimes the things that we need to learn. So if I encounter a patient who's challenging me in in my treatment, right, mm. it might be uncovering an opportunity for me to learn a different perspective about that treatment. My patients have been my greatest teachers. That always. has been always my greatest teachers. And obviously in my profession, but sometimes in life too. And individuals can be triggered emotionally at any point in time. And it's about handling that is about really maintaining stability where you are responding and not reacting. Okay. And responding in a way that is non-threatening. So it's going along the the phrase of addressing the incident, not the person. Like you didn't come in at blah, blah, blah. It's like, it's not about the schedule. (laughs) It's not about the thing that is upsetting the the patient. It's not about that. It's about the energy of it. Okay. So 
you could just say to somebody, good morning. And if they've had a crap, like, who are you to say good morning today? <laughs> it's not <laughs> a good morning. It's How dare you? Bad. Yes. And I think as some, as a professional who works with patients directly, a lot, some people don't have anyone else to talk to. Mm. And I know in somebody once said that physical therapists are the bartenders of healthcare. <laughs> so that's one perspective. And just again, taking a step back and not taking anything personally from an individual, because what they're showing you is not about you. And in fact, taking something personally is the ultimate in selfishness because it, it's leading you to believe that the world revolves around you. Oh, good point. Yeah. That's, that's a really so, good point. So what you're saying is when a patient comes in, regardless of how they're treating you, it's mm -hmm. how you react to that. So you can take that on board and use it in a positive way or use it in a negative way and then start labelling them. That's right. And making judgments. And yeah. energy is neither created nor destroyed. It's honestly, it's interacting always, right? Okay. So you're talking about mm -hmm. communication here. So if they come in mm -hmm. slightly aggressive, if you come back aggressive, then exactly. it will escalate. If they come in yeah. aggressive and you bring your tone down, more than likely you're going to bring their tone down as well because they're realizing, oh, you're not challenging me here. You're trying to understand. Absolutely. And not only in your verbal communication, but in your nonverbal communication. Okay. So your body so, language. Body language and thoughts. So our thoughts have energy, our words have energy, and it's not something that an untrained person would normally catch up on, <laughs> yeah. but it is something that is apparent. So sometimes there are places or people that we just love to be around, like the beach for most people. <laughs> for yeah. some people, it's something else, right? But there are certain places, situations, things that make us create something and we can't really express it. Okay. There's a supermarket nearby. And when I'm in the produce section, I just feel great. Like this big produce section with all of these vegetables and fruits. And it's always overflowing with all of these plants. And it just, it's a palpable difference for me than another part of that store. It's really kind of interesting. And again, it's something that not everybody tunes in on, but it's there. And so sending loving thoughts to a person, particularly if you've had a not great experience about that, but just sending that person loving thoughts, light, love, energy, that kind of thing versus making up a story about this person being a psychic vampire. Yeah. And our thoughts create our future. It's, that's mindset work, right? And where our focus goes, energy flows. And so... I did this with, in a seminar with Tony Robbins where he said, okay, Tyson, I want you to think about everything brown in your living room. So think about the brown, think of going scan around the room brown. Okay, now tell me what's red. So if you're always looking at the brown of a person, you're never going to see the red. If you're always looking at the dark or focusing on the dark of the person, that's oftentimes that reacts to them and, and it will come back to you. So Good I've point. seen this over and over for myself, not just working with patients, but working people, just people in my life, where is if I have a predisposed thought pattern about how something's going to be, that's often how it shows up. Okay. If I change my thoughts, then that will be how it shows, how it shows up. But even your own emotions can change when you might be feeling a little bit down Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've got all these negative self-talk going in your head and then all of a sudden you receive a card in the mail or a letter from somebody right. or an email and they'll say how you've had such a positive impact on their mm -hmm. life and all of a sudden you read that and every bit of negative energy you had all of a sudden just lifts up from mm -hmm. that one item that you actually receive. Exactly. And doing something that's high vibrational with that individual, just even it being a thought or a smile, sometimes makes the biggest difference, knowing that you care. How can yeah. I make this better for you? Have you ever had a patient, though, that has come in and has been rude or abrupt, and every time they're always rude and abrupt and it never changes, that's just that they were weaned on vinegar 
and that's just no, no. never have. Mm -hmm. That is fantastic. So well, that personality too, like every time I talk, I always feel good when I talk with you and I'm glad you're in my life and in my circle of people yeah. I call friends. Thank you. And I think sometimes, like you said, you're going to attract certain people too. So if you're maybe a little bit abrupt or, or, or something like that, you may attract that type of patient more often mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, they say that the universe life or whatever is showing you exactly what you need to heal. Yeah. And when you point a finger at someone, you're pointing four back at yourself. <laughs> if you're finding someone who's not communicating, right? Yeah. Then you can say, well, am I not communicating or am I not clear in my communication? So things like that, it's something to look at. It's not always, that's not a hard, fast rule. There's other, there's other things that could be going on, but compassion is huge. I did, I, I do remember there was this one back when I was working in New York City and I would go to patients' homes. There was this one lady, and I do remember her being pretty pretty nasty the first few visits and yeah I won her over <laughs> just because I cared and also I was very good at what I did so yeah. we got results and again sometimes people are going to show up in not such a great way but it's never about you it's not about taking it personally and I have I have a great story that I shared with a colleague who talked to me recently about a, a really awful situation. And I said, what happened? It was not about the bill. It was not about, it was about the energy of it. It's never yeah. about the actual circumstances. Those are the symptoms, right? Those are the symptoms, just like somebody might have uh, pain in their big toe. That's a symptom. That's not what's causing it. That's not yeah. the, the root cause of it. The root cause causes deeper. And I said, so if you try to argue the situation and you go back and forth, it's when you're arguing about the situation, which it's not about, that you wind up wasting time and energy trying to be right. Good point. And so I used this situation that happened to me here in Florida. Florida, we have these gentle, beautiful, big mammals called manatees. Okay. They're the most docile creature. They're, they're vegetarian, so they're not going to eat anybody. They're not going to bite anybody, but they are as big as a shark. They're yeah. huge. They're quite large. and But they are gentle. They're gentle, and they just kind of float around and mind their own business, and they're cute. They have these little cute faces and whiskers. And I was on my paddleboard, and the water's quite clear, and I saw these two boulders on, as I was approaching on my paddleboard. And I thought to myself, I'm like, that's strange. There's no big rocks here in the Gulf of Mexico. And, but, and I said to myself, I'm like, Oh, I hope I don't fall on one of them because it was shallow. Like my board doesn't hit and whatever. Yeah. That they were manatees. They were sleeping. And when I went over them, they flew and bash. I've never seen them move so fast. And they <laughs> almost knocked me off my board. I fell down. I didn't get knocked off, but I use that analogy that, you could be peaceful in a great place. I was not thinking anything negative. I was just minding my own business, enjoying my paddleboard. And these beautiful, gentle creatures who don't harm anybody were in their own space, probably sleeping. <laughs> and but yet, because I would because I was a, a perceived threat or the situation was a perceived threat, I wasn't because I wasn't going to harm them, but the situation was a perceived threat, they reacted. And I think that's what happens to individuals when there is a situation that reminds them of something that was hurtful and they can react that way. Okay. That, no, that, that all makes sense. And that's why, like I said, when I decided to get other people to come in and share their thoughts on it, because mm -hmm. when I did the episode 307, yeah, bad and difficult patients, it did, some people did react. A certain way which i thought was quite funny yeah yeah surprisingly and mm. but what it is they they looked at what i said is that i was putting people directly into a box of that's bad mm. this is difficult mm. that's right mm. and even though in that particular episode i probably did mm -hmm. but at the same mm. stage you got people listen to the episode cool. and then and the best part about it is it then produced these episodes off the back mm. of it 
to get more perspectives on what this is. And as I'm talking to more people, my thinking, and I hope everyone listening to this, their thinking on good, bad, difficult, unhappy, challenging, whatever you want to call it, has actually broadened a little bit more too. So this has been absolutely fantastic. Excellent. And language also has energy, has yeah. power. So there are certain words that are more powerful in the perceived positive versus perceived negative. And I think I even was taught somewhere along my journey in, as a student that um, never to say that there was a bad patient. There's challenging patients, but yeah. no one's bad. Right. And also to assign a adjective to a person makes it personal. Okay. Versus their behavior. So, so to say a patient is challenging or a patient is bad or whatever you're going to say or good yeah. or label, it's labeling really, but it could be that patient's behavior or compliance was good. That patient's behavior and compliance was bad. Mm. And that makes it different than a bad patient. Yeah, right? no, that, there, that makes it's, sense. It's about the behavior, not the person. Yeah, and I actually said that in the episode that uh, someone that you class as a bad patient doesn't necessarily mean they're a bad person. Right. Because there, yeah. there's so much more to it than, yeah. than actually meets the eye. So anyway, DL, this has been great. Thank you for coming on, sharing your perspective on My this. Pleasure. And like I said, when I put this all together, I think it's going to broaden everybody's thinking and it has been great. So thank you very much. Thank you. I look forward to the episode. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode with the four people that were interviewed. We had just a review again, Robert Isaacs from the UK, Cameron Bennett from Brisbane, Estelle Humphreys from Adelaide, and DL Walker from Florida. And I, I love the way that everyone had different perspectives on good, bad, and difficult. And no two answers, I think, were the same. Everybody's was a little bit different. So I really hope you enjoyed that. I hope you took something away from that. And you probably have your own idea on the difference between good, bad, and difficult. And nobody is right and nobody is wrong. So like I said, I hope you enjoyed that. And tune in next week for the next four guests, which will be Jonathan Small, Bronwyn Cooper, Richard Chasen, and Liam McManus. Okay. So as I usually say, I want you to look after yourself, look after your family, and I will talk to you next week. Bye for now.